Uh, hello, and uh, welcome to History 1302. This is the first um, video lecture uh, of 1302. We will have one of these for each chapter, and this is going to go over the information in the chapter uh, and pick out some of the more important things. Uh, this is so that uh, in order to get the information from the chapter, you have the option to either read the book or listen to these lectures um, or do whatever you would like to do uh, in that regard uh, as far as working with the material in the textbook. Uh, the first chapter uh, that we'll be talking about is chapter 17, which talks about uh, the West and, uh, and the kind of role the West has to play uh, in U.S. history after the Civil War. Uh, prior to the Civil War, the West uh, generally was a source of conflict uh, because of the always looming question of what about slavery uh, in the territories. After the Civil War, the slavery issue is definitively dealt with, uh, and so the history of the West moves into much more, I guess, varied uh, purposes as far as U.S. history is concerned. Uh, industrialization really takes off, and uh, the West and the territory in the West really contributes to to that as well. Uh, they, the West, essentially serves the the purpose that the colonies did under the the mercantilist system that European countries espoused early on uh, in America's colonial history, uh, and that is essentially as a source of raw materials and a market for Eastern manufactured goods. Uh, and so this chapter is going to take a look at the West and, uh, and what the purpose of the West becomes uh, after the Civil War. So the most visible and probably dramatic aspect of the transformation of the Western territories uh, is the destruction of the traditional native ways of life. Uh, these are methods that had pretty much dominated the Western territories uh, prior to this point because those were the people who were living there. Uh, change began even before uh, the sort of mid-century influx uh, of white settlers into the West. Um, during the mid-19th century, however, the tribes did resist uh, but by the 1890s, confinement on reservations uh, was the ultimate fate uh, for nearly every tribe living in the Western territories in order to make room for white settlement as it was moving in. The tribes that inhabited the Great Plains uh, inhabited three major subregions. Uh, in the Northern Plains, you had large tribes like the Lakota uh, and the Northern Cheyenne. Some were allies, uh, others were, were rather bitter enemies. Uh, in that area. In the Central Plains, you have the five civilized tribes, or the so-called civilized tribes, that were moved there from the southeast uh, during the removals in the 1830s uh, under Andrew Jackson, if you remember. Uh, farming lifestyle was the sort of dominant form uh, of living in this particular territory. And then on the Southern Plains, you had groups like the Comanche, uh, the Southern Cheyenne, the Apache, who were mostly sort of nomadic in, in their lifestyle, tended to be very migratory. There was also considerable diversity among the Great Plains tribes, uh, and the customs tended to vary between different subgroups. Even within the same general tribe, different subgroups might have different customs. Um, many of them used horses, uh, now very well, uh, horses which had been obtained from the Spanish for the most part uh, in order to roam the high plains and to follow the buffalo migrations. Horses became very useful for uh, hunting buffalo once they were introduced. All of them basically shared a culture based on extended family and tribal cooperation, much as is, uh, is normal for native populations in the Americas generally. Uh, their rather complex religion also provided some kind of glue that held the village or the camp uh, together. On the kind of semi-arid high plains, uh, you have an abundance of both bison and people who had to adapt to what could be a rather harsh environment. 
Uh, in the winter, the herds would break into smaller groups and uh, move down into the river valleys in order to survive. And in summer, they would come back to the high plains in order to mate and to, to eat the grasses there. Uh, and things like that. And people tended to follow the same seasonal patterns because they were basically following the herds. Hunting bison provided not only food, uh, clothing, and shelter, but it also turned into a very valuable commercial product. Uh, buffalo robes were very popular items. And uh, the Native American tribes capitalized on this uh, in their harvest of animals and probably uh, harvested more animals than they strictly needed to to survive. So that was at least one change in their lifestyle thanks to uh, exposure to European settl settlers uh, or American settlers at this point. Miners began moving into the eastern high plains in about the 1850s uh, and their actions eroded the habitat intended to threaten this lifestyle that dominated on the high plains. Miners, uh, mining settlements, usually sprung up around the river valleys where the bison would winter, uh, and they would exhaust all the grasses there, which disrupted the bison's pattern, and then in turn disrupted the pattern that the Native Americans practiced as well. Uh, Buffalo Bill uh, was a rather famous scout who notoriously killed thousands uh, of buffalo in order to feed railroad crews as the transcontinental railroads were being set down across the West during this period as well. The army also tended to encourage the slaughter of the buffalo in order to discourage any kind of resistance uh, from Native American tribes, so that by the 1880s, buffalo herds were well diminished, uh, and the lifestyle that was dependent upon them, these sort of nomadic high plains tribes, uh, was threatened, if not entirely ruined, by that uh, over uh, abundance of hunting. So as we were saying, um, thousands of miners fled into the Western territories, lured by gold and silver uh, in the 1850s. Previously, the government viewed the West as a kind of giant reserve for Native American tribes. Uh, but in order to get them out of the way, for these new mining uh, interests. They now adopted a system of smaller tribal reservations uh, where they could be concentrated uh, by force if necessary. Some tribes adjusted quite peacefully to this, uh, like the Pueblo, who had already sort of adjusted to the colonial system through their dealings with the Spanish uh, during colonial times. Uh, others opposed the new policy quite fiercely uh, and so that's when you get into what becomes known as the Indian Wars, rather uh, politically incorrectly known as the Indian Wars. You have very significant segments of the Great Plains tribes uh, who fought quite fiercely against these removals. Between 1860 and 1890, these tribes faced the U.S. Army in a series of battles for the West. Uh, even during the Civil War, the, the fighting was going on between the U.S. Army, or the Union Army, uh, and Native tribes in the West, um, which made the Civil War extra challenging for the Union Army. This conflict was marked largely by, uh, this particular conflict, the, the Indian Wars, as they were called, was marked largely by misunderstanding, a series of broken promises, uh, and a great deal of brutality and butchery. In 1864, uh, near Sand Creek, Colorado, a group of soldiers destroyed a Cheyenne uh, and Arapaho camp, or Cheyenne and Arapaho camps, rather. Uh, the tribes then retaliated with a string of attacks on travelers moving through the area. This greatly alarmed the governor of Colorado, who authorized settler settlers to kill on site any hostile natives and called up a regiment of troops under uh, a man called Colonel Chivington. To, uh, to deal with the problem. On November 29th, Chivington and his men attacked a camp of peaceful natives, uh, including large numbers of women and children, and killed all of them. This became known as Chivington's Massacre, and it rekindled a, a big public debate over Indian policy uh, within the federal government. In 1867, Congress sent a peace commission 
to try and end the fighting and set aside reserves in both Kansas and Nebraska for the effective tribes. They were hoping that these tribes would take up farming and to convert to Christianity um, so as to make them a bit more compliant. Behind the persuasion, you also have a sort of menacing threat of force. Uh, anyone that resisted would be subject to military supervision and uh, the kind of brutality that tended to go along with that. The plan appeared to be working. Uh, at first, representatives of about 68,000 southern tribes uh, gathered together and signed what became known as the Medicine Lodge Treaty in 1867. Uh, and the following year, representatives of nearly 54,000 tribes came together and signed what became known as the Fort Laramie Treaty. However, dissatisfaction with the treaties ran very deep throughout the tribes, uh, and many members of the tribes rejected the new system and refused to move or to stay there once they were forcibly moved. Uh, this kind of involves the structure of tribes. Uh, government officials were attempting to deal with chiefs as we would the leaders of foreign countries, uh, whereby if you sign an agreement with a foreign president or a foreign prime minister or something like that, then that agreement is binding on everyone in that country because of how systems of authority work uh, in Western nations. The tribes aren't like that. The chiefs don't have that kind of power. Uh, and quite often, you would get uh, younger members of the tribes who would challenge the chief's authority uh, kind of an attempt to take over the tribe, especially if they disagreed with them. Uh, and so it's a bit more of a delicate balance for uh, as far as authority went within the tribes. And so the fact that the chiefs or, or a representative signed these treaties didn't necessarily mean that the entire tribe would just go along with it. Uh, and it was that kind of misunderstanding on the part of government representatives and government officials that uh, ultimately led to the failure of any of these treaties. Um, in August of 1868, war parties began raiding settlements in Kansas and Colorado, and soldiers began attacking native populations, even peaceful native populations, in retaliation for this. By the autumn, uh, a gentleman called Colonel Custer led a party who then attacked a sleeping Cheyenne village and captured the people and slaughtered horses uh, there in that village. By 1869, Congress established the Board of Indian Commissioners, uh, drawing from major protest demonstrations as well as hoping to reform some of the more obvious abuses on the reservations. However, problems quickly uh, arose as a result. The natives tended to leave the reservations in large numbers, uh, because there was very little incentive for them to stay on them. Uh, you also have white settlers who very frequently purchased reservation land, so the reservations were slink shrinking, uh, and so they couldn't house the number of people that they were hoping to keep on them. Frustrated by the manipulation of the treaties, uh, as well as inept agents, Congress replaced the treaties with executive orders, uh, as well as act acts of Congress in 1871, essentially abolishing all of the treaties and agreements. Uh, in the midst of all this government infighting, the natives are striking back with raids in the Texas Panhandle in 1874 and continued their struggle until 1886 when their leader, Geronimo, finally surrendered. And now we get to one of the uh, more notable, I suppose, events uh, of this particular episode of American History. The first treaty of Fort Laramie, uh, or actually it was the second treaty of Fort Laramie in 1868, uh, set aside the Great Sioux Reserve in perpetuity, but not all the Sioux agreed to this treaty. Uh, in 1873, the Oglala and the Brule bands managed to remain on their traditional lands and to protect their hunting grounds. They raided non-native settlements uh, in places like Nebraska and Wyoming and generally harassed anyone who attempted to move onto their territory. By 1874, General Sherman 
was sent with a force under Colonel Prester, again, into the Black Hills in order to extract concessions from these uh, non-conforming Sioux bands. In 1875, the negotiations to buy back the Black Hills broke down, uh, and Custer sought to try and drive them off of the land. In June of 1876, he and about 600 troops were sent to the Little Bighorn River, uh, and it was supposed to be a scouting mission, uh, but he sort of extrapolated extra information from that mandate. And on the morning of the 25th of June, very unwisely attacked uh, a rather massive force of Native Americans with only about 200 or so men. He had divided his force, left the majority of them behind, uh, and took only a very small force uh, and then decided to attack. He and his men were completely wiped out. The rather unexpected victory left a lot of Americans reeling. Uh, some questioned the wisdom of current federal policy as a result. Most, however, endorsed the federal decision to violently, if need be, squash all resistance uh, in the West. So uh, a victory, uh, in fact, but a defeat in result as far as the, the Sioux were concerned. That defeat as well also made the army much more determined, and they harassed various Sioux bands for more than five years. Similar measures were also used elsewhere, which kind of slowly sapped all of the energy out of the resistance as it was there. I also want to call your attention to the picture here, uh, which is going to become bigger. And this is a bulletin or flyer really advertising Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, uh, which was a very popular show uh, throughout the country. They did performances everywhere. Uh, and some of them even took performances overseas uh, to do in foreign countries. This one is advertising a performance of a reenactment of Custer's Last Stand. And uh, the sign here is essentially propaganda, uh, but it's very interesting to, uh, to sort of note what sort of features are showing uh, in this particular bit of propaganda. Here you can see um, essentially a construction of heroism, which uh, is surrounding the figure of Custer, uh, who's in the middle, he's in the sort of tan uh, outfit, and you can see his hair and his, his rather notable handlebar mustache. Uh, which kind of characterized him. He's sitting there fighting back to back uh, with one of his soldiers. And they're fighting off uh, valiantly, yet obviously and ultimately unsuccessfully, uh, a savage band of natives. Uh, you can see some dead natives there. And you can see some dead soldiers there. But what I really want you to, to kind of get out of this is just how you get the sort of construction of heroism. Kind of ultimately with Custer, um, he was acting outside of his mandate, uh, essentially. Uh, he decided to attack a group that he wasn't uh, technically okayed to attack, and he did it rather poorly. Um, he decided to attack with a relative handful of men compared to the thousands that were waiting on him, and so there's really nothing really heroic about him. Um, it was uh, a massive military blunder, and uh, and Custer seems to be a fairly annoying, uh, annoyingly sort of arrogant individual anyways. Um, yet the image we have of him here, uh, and the image that a lot of times we get of him is one that's actually rather heroic, uh, and in some ways betrays actual events in that sense. Also interestingly, uh, the Native Americans, he was well known because of his earlier actions, uh, which I mentioned. 
And the Native Americans particularly wanted to get a hold of his lovely blonde-headed scalp uh, with the long hair that was quite noticeable. Uh, he had actually cut his hair just before the battle. And so although he did die, they didn't recognize him. He cut his hair and he shaved his mustache. And so although he did die, they didn't notice him or they didn't recognize him. And so uh, he wasn't scalped, uh, which makes this picture actually fairly inaccurate because he didn't actually look like that. Uh, as he was fighting. But again, it's uh, showmanship more than anything. So more and more, uh, Americans are becoming fed up with the government disregard for the treaties agreed upon with Native Americans and the general treatment of the government towards the Native American groups. Groups like the Women's National Indian Rights Association started to take up the cause uh, here in favor and support of the native tribes. Imagine in support of in quotations, however. They hope to encourage them to give up their nomadic lifestyles. Um, reformers, in order to, to try and encourage this, advocated the creation of boarding schools um, believing that their customs and languages prevented them from embracing white civilization and so if we could sort of indoctrinate those out of the younger generations, then that would go away. However, despite their best efforts, attempts to stamp out uh, their sort of native identity often backfired as students would form their own sort of brand of native identity. Uh, the groups also felt that interests would be best served by, break, served by breaking up the reservations, ending tribal th authority altogether, and incorporating them as individual citizens rather than entire tribes. Out of this, you get the passage of the Dawes Severalty Act in 1887. This sought to turn natives into landowners and farmers uh, and emphasize treatments as individuals rather than as a tribe. Each individual uh, was given 160 acres of reservation for farming and up to 320 for grazing. Uh, for the head of each family, not each individual, but each head of the family, uh, if they accepted the provisions. There was no timetable for the breakup of reservations, and actually very few allotments were handed out or partitioned um, before 1890. This was, however, great for land speculators in the West who managed to evade the safeguards relatively easily and buy up Native American land from the Native Americans who got them. Uh, some that did receive the land survived on it, but most of them struggled to survive because their allotment was poor. Uh, the Great Plains are particularly good for agriculture. Um, hunting was limited. Alcoholism became a problem due largely to boredom uh, and other difficulties conforming to the limitations of the reservation. Uh, essentially a symptom of depression, if you like. Uh, living conditions for the Sioux worsened uh, in the late 1880s. Meat rations were reduced, hunting was restricted, cattle were dying, uh, and it made a lot of them very desperate. Uh, and they turned eventually to a new prophet, a man called Wavaka, who foresaw an event that would return dead relatives, restore the bison herds, and renew traditional life. Uh, he was essentially the, uh, the Sioux version of a televangelist. He preached a return to traditional ethics and taught a new ritual song and dance, which became known as the Ghost Dance. Uh, this ritual spread amongst the Sioux uh, and alarmed a lot of officials. Um, police were dispatched in order to arrest Sitting Bull, who was uh, one of the leaders, and when he was pulled from his cabin, shots were fired, and he was mortally wounded and eventually died. On the 29th of December, cavalry were rounding up the starving and freezing Sioux near Wounded Knee, and uh, a shot was fired from some unknown source. Soldiers responded with cannon fire, and within minutes, hundreds of natives lay dead on the ground. This basically marks the end of a generation's worth of conflict. Because after this, I mean, the spirit of these native tribes are basically broken at this point. Uh, and so 
the conflict itself, the at least obvious conflict, uh, ends pretty much at this point. And the picture on the slide here is uh, essentially cleaning up the mess uh, at Wounded Knee following the uh, massacre there, uh, essentially. So, um, the removal of the Native Americans to reservations and then the consolidation of the reservations into allotments um, basically opened up a massive amount of territory for settlement. Beginning in the 1840s, people began making the six to eight month long overland journey and wagons in order to get to places like Oregon and California. By the 1870s, uh, railroads began making that trip a lot faster. The first transcontinental railroad, uh, railroads rather, began being built in the 1860s actually. In 1862, the Pacific Railroad Act authorized the construction of new transcontinental links. Uh, it gave grants of land and subsidies to railroads for each mile of track that they laid down, which accelerated the transformation of just everyday life uh, in the Western territories. The railroads turned to immigrants, largely for inexpensive labor, uh, and a lot of times Chinese immigrants. Uh, the Central Pacific preferred Chinese laborers uh, because they had a tendency to work hard for low wages. They didn't drink, uh, and they also usually brought their own food and tents, so they were a lot easier to board, if you like. In May of 1869, the first Transcontinental Railroad completed its tracks, uh, which they were being built from either end, uh, and they met in Utah, and famously you had a golden spike, uh, or nail, nailed into to the tracks, uh, and there was a big ceremony. If any of you have seen the, the rather awful Will Smith Wild Wild West movie, they pay homage to that uh, idea. Uh, whacking in the golden uh, railroad spike. The railroad sped up western development uh, after it was completed. The army would use it to ship men and supplies uh, in the dead of winter whenever their foes were most vulnerable uh, during the ongoing conflicts with the Native Americans. Bison hunters uh, achieved very quick access to herds um, and it also hastened the arrival of new settlers uh, and later was used to ship their grain uh, and cattle to eastern markets uh, from the western areas as well. Congress granted uh, over 170 million acres uh, in the decades following the Pacific Railroad Act, uh, or rather in the single decade following the Pacific Railroad Act. As major landowners, the railroads had very unique opportunity to shape settlement in the region as well as make a huge chunk of change. So they set up offices and sent uh, recruiting agents to bring settlers in. Uh, they would offer long-term loans uh, and free transportation and encourage families to immigrate together uh, and in groups of families. So several families would immigrate all to one place so they could essentially kind of found their own community. The unintended consequence of this was that land was made available to single women who would sometimes take homesteads as individuals um, in order to add to the family holdings uh, as a way to kind of work the system. The railroad also helped to bring nearly 2.2 million new foreign immigrants to America uh, with agents going to Europe and recruiting people to come over and move west, sometimes even recruiting entire villages uh, from European countries. This also greatly influenced agriculture. Uh, families were urged to specialize in cash crops, whether it was wheat or corn or cotton or whatever, uh, in order to sh ensure the repayment of the loan that they had taken out from the railroad. Uh, initially, this was very profitable, but farmers became far too dependent on a single crop, uh, and so that made them very vulnerable to market fluctuations. And actually, farmers pretty much received the raw end of the deal, economically speaking, for decades, uh, really up until the 1930s. Uh, 
liberalized land laws also served to pull settlers westward. The Homestead Act, which was passed in 1862, offered 160 acres to anyone who would pay a $10 registration fee and live on their land and cultivate their land for 10 years. Nearly 400,000 families claimed land uh, through that act, but it didn't quite work the way it was intended to. Speculators would fall, file false claims, uh, and the railroad also managed to acquire huge holdings through the act. The 160-acre limit created some problems as well. Uh, if you managed to get a hold of 160 acres of good soil, um, then that was great, and it worked out for you, but if it was in a drier region, then you quite often needed more than 160 acres and you were sort of out of luck. Various measures were passed to try and combat this problem, but it, again, was abused by speculators, lumber companies, as well as cattle ranchers, uh, in order to take advantage of uh, cheap land, essentially. There were also some fairly difficult psychological adjustments that were required for anyone who wanted to move out to the frontier. Uh, you had to build a house uh, as well as plant a crop. You had to dig a well, all of which required hours of backbreaking work uh, in relatively isolated surroundings. Um, for black Americans who migrated after the Civil War, prejudice also made uh, their difficulties even more so. Women also found adjusting especially difficult. Uh, many wrote complaints of nuisances like mosquitoes and thunderstorms with golf ball sized hail, uh, blinding blizzards in the winter time, and uh, the necessity of living in crude sod huts. Many uh, of the women were unprepared for these sorts of things, uh, hence their complaints. The rather high transience rate reflected the difficulty of these adjustments. Nearly half of those who stayed to claim in Kansas between 1862 and 1890 gave up their claim and moved on or moved back east. This trend was not uniform, though. Settlers in places like Minnesota and the Pacific Northwest had considerably higher rates of uh, persistence, and those who weathered the, the rather lean early years eventually came to identify with that region and with their place on it and worked out how to survive there and not be completely miserable. Um, so you just had to kind of stick it out. A lot of people weren't willing to stick it out, but those who did eventually made it. Farmers also took advantage of mechanization and developed new strains of wheat and corn in order to produce, to boost production, excuse me, um, essentially through the means of genetic modification. So uh, GMOs are a lot older than uh, people would have you believe, I suppose. Steel plows, uh, wheat planters, uh, mechanized wheat planters, improved grain binders, windmills, all of this in, served to increase production. Barbed wire was utilized to keep the sort of roving livestock out of crops. Uh, but touched off quite violent conflict between farmers and ranchers. Uh, however, farmers generally won out as the sort of cattle kingdom ranching era only lasted about 20 years or so. New machinery, as well as new demand for products like wheat and milk, uh, made it appear that farming was entering into a period of unparalleled prosperity. Uh, of course, it wasn't a permanent period of unparalleled prosperity. Uh, startup capital for farming tended to be fairly high, uh, more than an average industrial worker could afford. Uh, and so a lot of industrial workers found that moving out west uh, to own their own land and become farmers was a dream that was forever outside of their grasp. A lot of farmers had to specialize in cash crops in order to pay off the debts, which they amassed while attempting to start up their farms. Um, they were also dependent on the railroads uh, and the rather shifting prices of the international grain market for their livelihood as well. So it was a fairly uncertain occupation. The idea of uh, sort of independent Westerners uh, is something of a myth. Uh, as they weren't terribly independent at all, they had to compete on a rather complex world market. 
um, economically speaking. And when prices fell, heavily indebted farmers faced utter ruin as a result of that. These kind of realities saw a lot of farmers abandoning their dreams of frontier independence and easy wealth, uh, and a lot of them abandoning the frontier altogether uh, and going back to eastern uh, industry and factories. Unpredictable weather also compounded all of these difficulties, uh, especially in the western plains, and you see the development of dry farming techniques, which is basically to plow really deep in order to kind of encourage the moisture uh, to go down deeper uh, and to enrich the soil that way. They also used irrigation uh, to feed the crops. However, this particular technique loosened the topsoil considerably and a combination of dry weather grasshoppers, which ate all the grass, uh, which generally keeps the topsoil in place. Uh, economic depression in the 1780s made the plight uh, of some Midwestern farmers quite desperate. And in fact, uh, the, the famed Dust Bowl in the 1930s is a result of decades worth of these dry farming techniques um, as the constant stirring of the topsoil made it a lot easier for winds to, to drum up those giant dust clouds uh, that we see in pictures uh, of the Great Depression. Despite all these hardships, though, uh, a lot of remote settlements managed to blossom into relatively thriving communities. Um, cooperation was a practical necessity, uh, as well as a form of insurance, uh, and so communities tended to be fairly tight-knit in the West. When the population increased, then they would lobby to turn the territory into a state. Residents had to petition Congress, uh, then they had to elect delegates to a constitutional convention who would write the constitution for the proposed state. Once that constitution was ratified by the population, they would then apply to Congress for statehood. Uh, although generally socially conservative, new states tended to support rather progressive ideas like women's suffrage. Seven states, in fact, held referenda between 1870 and 1910, with Wyoming being the first state to allow women to vote uh, in the hopes of attracting women and families to the territory itself. Utah was next in 1870, and by 1910, only uh, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and Idaho granted full voting rights to women, so you have some progressive notions taking root in the frontier as well. So, with the annexation of Texas and the Mexican cession, the U.S. acquired a huge amount of territory. And although the U.S. pledged to protect the property of Mexicans who wanted to stay on that territory and would just become part of the United States, over the next three decades or so, a lot of those individuals were forced off of their lands. Those that stayed uh, adapted to New Anglo society with uh, relatively limited success. The struggle for independence in Texas left a lasting legacy of bitterness as well as misunderstanding uh, between American and Mexican settlers in Texas. Cotton planters uh, confiscated Mexican land and began a racist campaign against them. Mexican bandits, in turn, retaliated for the loss of their lands by raiding communities. Uh, and so the result was, in fact, bitterness on both sides. Mexican Americans in California also faced similar problems. Bad weather and slumping of the cattle industry ruined a lot of the lanchen, sorry, ranches. Uh, which were owned by descendants of the original Spanish settlers to the region, and many of them were forced off their ranches and into segregated urban neighborhoods called barrios. In western states, patterns of racial discrimination, manipulation, and exclusion were common for uh, new Mexican-Americans as well as Native Americans and Chinese immigrants. As the number of white settlers increased in the West, they began to identify minority differences as marks of inferiority. White legislators would pass laws making land ownership difficult uh, for minority groups and forcing a lot of them to become migratory workers 
these migratory workers were derided as shiftless and irresponsible, but their labor was invaluable to the economic development of Western states. Cultural adaptation to Anglo society in places like New Mexico and Arizona went much more smoothly, at least initially. Spanish settlement was sparse, uh, and there were a few wealthy landowners that had dominated uh, the poorer residents for decades in that region. Wealthy Mexicans educated their children in the U.S. Uh, and established business alliances with Americans, and those close ties helped them make uh, a smoother transition. The success of these men uh, and the romanticiz romanticization uh, of them by novelists helped moderate uh, the more antagonistic attitudes of American settlers. However, conflicts over territory still persisted in those regions. In the 1880s, Mexican-American ranchers organized a vigilante group called the White Caps. Um, it didn't stop corporate ranchers from increasing their holdings, uh, and discrimination did limit economic op opportunities in towns and cities, even in these regions. Uh, and so generally, uh, it was difficult for those groups to assimilate into to the new American lifestyle, I suppose. <laughs> so the displacement of Mexican and Native Americans from their land also opened the doors to exploitation of the natural environment. And this set in motion a sort of boom and bust economy where some would make it really big uh, and others would lose it really big. In California, the gold rush uh, began in 1849 and produced a series of mining booms uh, in various years. In 1853, the Comstock Lode was discovered by a man called Henry Comstock uh, along the Carson River. Following this, uh, the Rocky Mountains were swarming with people hoping to discover gold, uh, and some very deep veins of gold and silver were discovered in that region. Gold was discovered in Idaho, uh, Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, as well as the Canadian Klondike, uh, and settlers flocked to those areas hoping to make it big. The popular press exaggerated uh, the report, but by 1900, more than one billion dollars worth of gold had been mined in California alone. Early discoveries uh, of gold which was just panned in streams, attracted a lot of young men uh, in search of wealth. And Western mining camps tended to be sort of like ethnic melting pots. Some prospectors became fabulously wealthy as a result of their efforts, but most couldn't afford to become fabulously wealthy. The larger depo deposits tend to be, tended to be embedded much deeper down uh, in quartz and, uh, and harder substances like that, and it required a larger investment in expensive equipment to extract it successfully. Once discoveries were made, they were quickly bought up by eastern as well as foreign mining companies, uh, and so individual wealth seekers uh, often lost out to those larger interests. Life in mining town was uh, always interesting and vibrant, although it could be somewhat unpredictable. Men tended to outnumber women, uh, about three to one. Money was very quickly made in these kinds of towns and also very quickly lost. Uh, during its heyday, Virginia City in Nevada boasted a population of about 20,000 with elaborate mansions built by successful prospectors. There was a six-story hotel, an opera house, over 130 saloons, four banks, uh, a Chinatown, as well as numerous brothels uh, all in the city. The same cycle of sort of boom and bust was repeated in cities across the West. So um, once it was discovered that uh, all the gold in the area of Virginia City had dried up, um, a large part of that population moved on elsewhere. And it happened in other cities as well. 
The gold rush also spurred the growth of settlement in Alaska. The discovery of gold in the Klondike brought thousands of prospectors and enabled Alaska to establish a territorial government in 1912. New ore deposits also lured transient populations uh, of those hoping to get rich quick, uh, but the work tended to be very dangerous. About 1 in 80 miners would die annually in the 1870s. If you consider that there are thousands of people working as miners, uh, not miners as in small children, but miners, M-I-N-E-R-S, um, even if you just take a thousand miners and you divide that by 80, um, that's roughly 13 people dying out of a thousand. Consider again that a population of a town like uh, sorry, I forgot the name of the town. Virginia City uh, is roughly 20,000. And we're looking at Sorry, my math's not doing very good. Uh, and we're looking at roughly 250 people who die uh, from the mining in that town in a year, uh, in 1870. Uh, in the decade, that is going to be about 2,500 or 2,600 people um, who will die in that decade as a result of mining. It's a roughly, it's a pretty large number. Most prospectors only earned enough to maybe buy land and to try again somewhere else. Um, but the millions of ounces of gold and silver that did come out uh, by the lucky ones who found it stimulated the economy, uh, brought the U.S. into the sort of mainstream of the world economy, and really helped to support the industrial boom that's happening in the country elsewhere. While the mining was profitable, it was also very e environmentally costly, sorry, um, hydraulic mining uh, polluted rivers and flushed tons of silt into the valleys, which created problems. Uh, landscapes were irreparably scarred uh, because of mining efforts. Uh, they would be li littered with gravel uh, filled with traces of mercury and cyanide uh, and other things like that, which would work its way down into the, the groundwater and cause problems. Smelters spewed very dense smoke uh, that was often filled with lead or arsenic or other carcinogens uh, into the air, which uh, if you lived in close proximity would make you violently ill as well. So there were, uh, of course, problems. Uh, not everything can be gold and shiny, obviously, all the time. Another way uh, that the West was uh, sort of exploited for economic gain uh, was or can be seen, rather, in the growth of open-range cattle ranching, which paralleled the expansion of mining. It was promoted by businessmen and railroad entrepreneurs hoping to uh, fund their investments in tracks. In 1868, a man by the name of Joseph McCoy combined organizational as well as promotional skills to mold the cattle industry into a new moneymaker. He uh, discovered that he could raise che steers cheaply, in places like Texas, and then bring them north to Kansas for shipment east on the railroad. Uh, they built a stockyard in Abilene, uh, Kansas, and by guaranteeing transportation on the railroad, got a kickback from the railroad. Uh, essentially, a little sort of tip for bringing business to the railroad. In order to move the herd easier, he helped to survey and shorten uh, what became known as the Chisholm Trail, which was the route used to, to drive the cows from Texas up to Kansas. In order to increase, in order to increase interest, rather, uh, he also staged the first Wild West show, which featured roping and riding exhibitions, uh, which is basically what you will see if you ever go to a ranch rodeo today, um, those same kinds of contests. Uh, and in fact, if you were to go uh, to, say, something like the Houston Rodeo, uh, I imagine there are other big ones as well, but I, I only have a lot of experience uh, 
with the Houston Rodeo. You have your main event, which is happening in the big sort of arena, but uh, in a smaller arena, sort of uh, in the same complex, they have a ranch rodeo going on. Uh, and that's where you're going to see things like riding uh, and shooting targets while riding, uh, wagon, like buggy racing, uh, and things like that. And that's really, um, those ranch rodeos today are kind of the direct descendants uh, of these early Wild West shows that, uh, that he was putting on. Cattle drives also turned into uh, sort of bonanzas for herd owners. Steers could be purchased in Texas for about $9 a head and could be sold in Kansas for about $28 a head. So you're making a massive profit on every steer that you drive north. And consider that most of those drives include hundreds of head of cattle. You're going to make a pretty good uh, chunk of change on one drive. Like grain growers, cattlemen also lived at the mercy of high interest rates as well as unstable markets. And by 1873, financial panic saw hundreds of cattle ranchers falling into bankruptcy. Very little of the profits that were made by herd owners also made its way into the hands of the cowboys who did most of the work. Um, the job of a cowboy was very laborious. You had long hours. Uh, it tended to be very dangerous, the pay was low, uh, and if you were older, the job was going to be well nigh impossible for you. Uh, most were young men in their teens or 20s. Uh, they could only work for about a year or so before moving on, so the turnover rate was quite high. Nearly a fifth of them were black or Mexican, as uh, discrimination barred them from a lot of other free trades. Uh, but many of them were able to distinguish themselves as uh, being resourceful and rather shrewd, like the individual pictured over to the side. Uh, the cattle bonanza peaked between 1880 and 1885 and produced about, or more than rather, 4.5 million head of cattle for eastern markets, but prices began to fall uh, and ranchers found themselves plunged into debt uh, in the early part of that, about 1882 or so. By 1885 you saw some of the coldest winters on record, uh, combined with summer droughts and illness, uh, and that uh, produced the destruction of nearly 90% of the cattle in some regions. The industry eventually survived, but with the railroad expanding into southern territories, uh, and with farming uh, and homesteading taking over a lot of the, the plains areas, the long cattle drives were pretty much at an end at that point. One legacy of the cattle boom was the growth of cities like Abilene, Kansas. Um, many of them went through a sort of early period of violence, uh, much like the, the big mining cities like Virginia City. Um, and like most cattle towns, they very quickly established a police force because it was necessary. Uh, city ordinance forbade things like carrying firearms, uh, they regulated saloons, gambling, and prostitution in order to make the town a little bit more palatable, I suppose. Uh, they aren't nearly as, or they weren't nearly rather, as violent or lawless as legends would have you believe, uh, but they did have a lively prostitution bu business, like most cities in the 1880s had a lively prostitution business. Uh, so it wasn't unique to cattle towns or mining towns or anything like that. You'd be able to find um, brothels and other such organizations uh, in eastern cities uh, as well. Prostitutes came from all social classes and levels uh, and as far away as places like China or Ireland. Some went into the trade, uh, the oldest trade, to escape things like domestic violence or economic hardship. Uh, others were forced into it, but all of them risked certain physical problems arising as a result. Uh, diseases were prevalent. Physical violence uh, often tended to be a, a signature of the, the prostitute's livelihood. Alcohol and drug addiction also tended to be problematic. As towns became much more settled, uh, women in other occupations increased, uh, and as women began moving in, you start to see movement against the brothels and they start to close down as a result.
uh, as well. Uh, the last form of sort of exploitation to take place in Western territories, uh, like the gold rushes and the cattle boom, uh, the wheat boom also started small, uh, but grew quite rapidly to produce the nation's first agribusinesses. The boom started in the Dakota Territory uh, during the Panic of 1873. Speculators bought over 300,000 acres very cheaply from the Northern Pacific Railroad. The characteristic of the Panic of 1873 was essentially the failure of railroads. And so they were able to buy up huge portions of land from those railroads who were trimming down uh, their operations. Speculators established kind of factory-like 10,000 acre farms. Uh, each of these was run by a hired manager and invested heavily in labor and equipment. Publicity of the successes of a few of these large uh, farms led to an unprecedented wheat boom in, uh, in the 1880s. Banking syndicates uh, and small farmers alike all rushed to try and purchase land uh, and wheat production skyrocketed to nearly 29 million bushels by 1890, mere 10 years later. Uh, however, profits evaporated very quickly after 1890 because of oversaturation in the market, um, largely. But there was also other things that contributed. High investment costs, uh, essentially startup capital, also created problems either having too much or too little rain, uh, otherwise attempting to control the weather, that was problematic. Um, heavy reliance on one particular crop uh, also created problems as if the, the price of that crop depressed, then you would find yourself in a pickle. Uh, and then the depression of prices for crops on the international market. Uh, which is essentially tied to the previous one, uh, the previous point. Large-scale farms proved most successful in places like California, where they could use canals and other irrigation systems to water their crops. Uh, and by the mid-1880s, farmers were growing high-priced specialty crops and creating cooperative marketing associations for them. Uh, things like Sunkist, which did oranges in California. Homesteaders also eyed Indian territory in what is now Oklahoma. The government considered the land virtually worthless, uh, and so they had reserved it for the five civilized, civilized tribes since the 1830s. Um, these tribes uh, sided with the Confederates during the Civil War, and all they had, uh, although they had already been punished, uh, the rather land-hungry settlers demanded more. And so in 1889, Congress transferred nearly two million acres of their land to the public domain. Um, Thousands of settlers flooded into the area in order to stake their claim, and in the next decade, the Dawes Act would break up the reservation even further into smaller allotments and free up even more land for settlers to move into. By 1898, the Curtis Act dissolved the reservations entirely and abolished all tribal governments. Oklahoma land rush demonstrated the continuing myth that free land equaled the ideal economic opportunity. However, most Oklahoma farmers doing well at first, but their rather exploitative farming practices, poor land management, the occasional drought, all of this would create the conditions that ultimately led, like I say, to the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. In a lecture given by a young historian, Frederick Jackson Turner, in 1893, he asserted that the frontier was essentially the bulwark of American democracy. Um, and it was, in fact, the existence of a frontier that created or furthered the, the democratic character uh, of American society. Although this assertion has since been invalidated, uh, as more Western land was settled in the 20th century than in the 19th century. Uh, and the linkage of economic opportunity to the transformation of the West uh, was still sort of captured the popular imagination. 
uh, despite the, the falseness of the assertion. And it launched into a new school of sort of historical inquiry. Most modern historians accept that most of this thesis is now inaccurate, but that idealized view that he proposes of the West reflects the popular opinion of the 1890s. Late in the 19th century, writers portrayed frontierism as mythic American Adam, if you like, uh, simple, virtuous, innocent, untainted by corrupt social order, much like Adam from the Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve story of the Bible. The West was seen as a place of adventure where one can escape society and all of its pressures. Authors of dime novels offered frontiersmen as the new masculine ideal, the, uh, the sort of tough guy that fights for truth and honor and justice. Wild West shows also uh, played into this uh, mythos, portraying cowboys engaging in mock battles with natives and reinforcing the image that the West was an arena for a moral encounter where virtue always triumphed over vice. Eastern writers also embraced parts, uh, both parts of that myth, uh, both escape from society as well as a stage for moral conflict. Theodore Roosevelt, uh, Frederick Remington, and Owen Wister were all affected by the adventure myth in turn. Roosevelt and Remington portrayed a rather stark physical and moral environment that stripped away all social artifice and tested the character of a man as a sort of proving ground for a new kind of virile manhood. The idea reached its apogee in Worcester's novel The Virginian, which portrayed an elemental environment that would produce individuals like his hero, who were honest and strong and compassionate. And for all three of these gentlemen, the cowboy was the Christian knight on the plains pursuing justice and attacking evil, which usually took the form of Native Americans. The myth, however, was far removed from reality uh, and often fails to mention the backbreaking work involved in frontier life. It glosses over the dark side of the brutalities which characterize the conflict with Native Americans, racial, racial discrimination uh, against minority groups like Mexicans, uh, blacks, and immigrant groups like the Chinese, economic risks uh, involved with the boom and bust mentality of cattle ranching, commercial agribusiness, mining, all of that. Um, it also obscured the link between the development of the frontier and the emergence of the U.S.'s major industrial nation, which was tied to a global economy, so the sort of escapist part of that myth was... Uh, inherently untrue as well. Despite this uh, idealized vision, the celebration of the Western experience highlighted uh, the threat to many unique features of the Western landscape and resulted in a surge of support for the creation of things like national parks. In his study, uh, titled Report on the Lands of the Arid Regions of the United States, John Wesley Powell urged Congress to establish government control of watersheds, uh, irrigation, and public lands. However, he was largely ignored. One group of adventurers was so taken with the scenery near the Yellowstone River that instead of claiming it for the railroad, they petitioned Congress to protect it from settlement. And in 1872, Yellowstone National Park was created. These first steps to preserve natural sites in the West marked the beginning of a changed awareness of the environment, a very small awareness of the environment. Uh, this involved or resulted in attacking the view that nature existed to be tamed and conquered, uh, and the plea went out for the conservation of the environment and found its most eloquent support in the work of men like John Muir, who fell in love with the redwood forest and campaign for their preservation in California. The precedent that was set by the creation of Yellowstone National Park remained ambiguous well into the 20th century, uh, although Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, was quite a champion of uh, conserving the natural environment. In 
parks which preserved high rugged landforms were protected because they were seen as having no other value uh, rather than for any real altruistic motive. Recognition of the need for biological conservation uh, would not come until much later. Uh, in fact, about the mid 20th century, the 60s and the 70s is when you get the real push uh, for that sort of thing. And uh, last but not least, I have some images I would like us to explore. Images that really highlight this kind of romanticized image of the West and especially uh, individuals who are often synonymous with the West, like cowboys and Indians. Uh, here you see three images, um, all by the same artist. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the dentist that I've gone to uh, ever since I was little uh, always had prints uh, from this particular artist in his office because I remember looking at them. But here you can see your kind of idealized view of essentially cowboys and Indians. Um, the gentleman on the left, I think, uh, is a sort of visual representation of this idea of uh, Western masculinity. Um, he's sort of tough uh, and worn and rough around the edges, but he has uh, a kind of honest and open gaze. Um, he looks like someone who's kind of world weary, but who wouldn't be one to stab you in the back. He wouldn't be someone to resort to unsavory methods of dealing with people uh, and things like that. Sort of inherently good, you like if you like. Uh, in some ways, that's uh, it's also a very inaccurate image. Um, the the gentleman playing the part of the cowboy here is a quite a good deal older, I imagine, from uh, the kind of people who would actually play the part. And uh, I think in some ways uh, age is often synonymous, or is often considered synonymous, with wisdom and, uh, and things like that. And so it's essentially being used as a symbolic device. You can also see the rather idealized uh, Indian up in the top right. Uh, and here you have in the bottom right uh, a scene which one might see played out uh, on a ranch or something like that. Uh, it appears to be a gentleman who's attempting to tame uh, or to break, rather, uh, a horse uh, so that it can be serviceable in that sense. All of these represent uh, a sort of romanticization of uh, the West, uh, the Western frontier, and, and all that, and kind of play into the myth of the frontier as well. A myth which continues on uh, well into our own time. It's a myth we've never quite let go of, uh, the sort of frontier myth. In fact, I think it was in 2008 or so that Sarah Palin wrote a book uh, talking about the significance of the frontier, essentially making similar arguments uh, to those of, of Frederick Jackson Turner. Uh, there and so it's a, it's still a myth that that we hear tossed out uh, in that sense and something that we've always seemed to held on to as Americans generally.